Shalom. All praises to the Heavenly Father. Hatun Apukuya. Praise be to the Earthly Mother, the Pacha Mama, and all of her earthly angels, the Huaka. Praise be to the Holy Spirit, the Kahe, in the name of Hamashiach, Mata the Lamb, unification to the nation. So, guys, we're continuing our discussion on uh, the origin of the Edomites, right? And about some of the history of the land of so-called Africa. Now, many people, they might be confused with what I'm trying to say. Some of it's confusing to me, too, because as I said in the last video, I kind of do this part by part. And for whatever reason, I'm just looking up King Zepho and finding even more connections. That's just how this works, man. This is the type of game and business that we're in. So <laughs> these are the results that happen. So today we're going to talk about the exploits and achievements of King Zepho and how they connect to certain other civilizations and possibly people that we know in history. They're pretty well known in history. Now, to as a disclaimer, um, the Book of Remembrance of Our Ancient Grandmothers, it explains who the people of Chittim actually are. It doesn't say who the people of Chittim are necessarily, but it says who or where the sons of Javan come from. And Javan is the forefather of the Chittim or the Kittim. And the Kittim are the other people who Esau intermarried with to create the Roman Empire. It said that uh, Javan, he was born very red. His skin was red. Now, is that talking about um, the type of quote unquote redness or pinkness that we know out of a certain group of people today? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Because as I'm seeing in many of these different, uh, you know, this, this different architecture from the so-called Romans and stuff like that, you know, it, it looks like them. It, it looks like many of the people today. <laughs> it, it looks like they have, uh, you know, this this pinkish skin and things of that sort. Looks like it. But there was another civilization that was right next to them that they overtook. Right. And we're going to try to make a few uh, connections. I'm, tr I'm trying not to make this into a, a long video. This is more of a video of me bringing out um some connections and you guys can look into it i might do a, a larger scale research on this in the next part and then we'll probably do one more part of this series where we'll talk about the holy roman empire right okay so let's begin and when the year came around being the 72nd year from the israelites going down to egypt after the death of Zo joseph Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, fled Egypt, he and his men, and they went away. Now, to give some background, um, Joseph, he had uh, Zepho and his men as slaves in Egypt. And once Joseph died, uh, they were let free. And he came to Africa, which is Din Haba, to Ajias, king of Africa. And Ajias received them with great honor. And he made and he made Zepho the captain of his host. Hold on. See, I don't know if anyone really caught this. I don't know what the translators were thinking when they wrote this. I'm actually very shocked that they would write something so blatant like this. Right? I'm actually incredibly shocked. For starters, the term Africa was really only known for the northern part, like above the Sahara. You know, according to some sources, some people say the whole land was some people say that it was recently named. I've already went over in the video that I did on the Berbers and um, what are they called? The Amorites. Right. That Africa is as some sort of relation to, yeah, the Berbers in northwest Africa. Right. That's what it that's what it has to do with. But hold on. If that's talking about northwest Africa or the above the Saharan Africa, right? If it's talking about one of the two, we know that's talking about Africa. If it's talking about Africa, how the hell is it in Din Haba? Let's look that up real quick. Because Din Haba occurs in the Bible two times in Genesis chapter 36, verse 32, and First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 43. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. 
this name of his city was Dinhaba. So Dinhaba is in the land of Edom. Let's read the other scripture. Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before their resigned any king over the children of Israel, Bela the son of Beor, and the name of his city was Din Haba. Again, guys, this is pretty much telling you that Din Haba was in Africa. Right? So is it that crazy to think that the land of Edom is in Africa? If the land of Canaan is over here in the Americas, Edom is supposed to be east of the Jordan, right? I've already told you where I think the land of Midian is. I, I'm, I'm, it's hard, it's hard for me to get around that. Um, for the, where, like how, like who, as far as the culture of the people of some of the people in Kenya and things of that sort, the book of Joshua also says that the Midianites were right next to the people of Cush along the, like they were near the Nile river, right? Moses, um, Moses' wife, uh, she's like, um, I'm sorry, what is her name? Zipporah. Yeah, she was called an Ethiopian by Aaron and Miriam. But if you're an Ethiopian, then you'd have to be a sub-Saharan African. Right? So there you go. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. I don't know where else Midian can be. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because Midian was supposed to be east of Edom and Moab. So Midian has to be east of Edom and Moab, and Canaan has to be west of Edom. So if the Midianites are in East Africa and the Israelites are in uh, the Pacific coastal area of the Americas, then Edom has to be somewhere in between those two points. You dig? Let's continue. And Zepho found favor in the sight of Ngias and in the sight of his people. And Zepho was captain of the host to Ngias, king of Africa, for many days. And Zepho enticed Ngias, king of Africa, to collect all his army to go fight with the Egyptians and with the sons of Jacob and to avenge of them the cause of his brethren. But Ngias would not listen to Zepho to do this thing, for Ngias knew the strength of the sons of Jacob and what they had done to his army in their warfare with the children of Esau. And Zepho was in those days very great in the size of Ingea, in the sight of Ingeus and in the sight of all his people. And he continually enticed them to make war against Egypt, but they would not. And then it talks about how, um, I'll just read it. And it came to pass in those days, there was in the land of Chittim, a man in the city of uh, Puzimna, whose name was Uzu. And he became degenerately deified by the children of Chittim. And the man died and had no son, only one daughter whose name was Jania. And a damsel was exceedingly beautiful, comely, and intelligent. There was none seen like her, like unto her beauty, for beauty and wisdom throughout the land. So pretty much uh, Angeus, the king of Africa, who, you know, has made um, some sort of a confederacy, with the Zepho and the Edomites, he marries uh, the daughter of Chittim, right? Skipping down. And the children of Chittim sent a memorial to Angea, saying, Behold, Turnus has sent for Jania to take her unto him for a wife. And thus have we answered him, and we heard he has collected his whole army to go to war against thee. And he intends to pass by the road of Sardunia to fight against thy brother Lucas. And after that, he will come to fight against thee. And Aegeus heard the words of the children of Chittim, which they sent to him in the, in the record. And his anger was kindled, and he rose up and assembled his whole army and came through the lands, the islands of the sea, excuse me, came through the islands of the sea, the road to Sardunia, unto his brother Lucas, king of Sardunia. So now they're about to start fighting and stuff, right? And through all of these different fights, uh, Zepho was the one who was shown to be very uh, competent in his wars and him helping Aegeus. 
But from that day forward, the troops of the king of Africa would go to Chittim to spoil and plunder it. And, wherever, and whenever they went, Zepho, the captain of the host of Angeus, would go with them. And it was after this that Angeus turned with his army and they came to the city of uh, Puzinma. And Angeus took thence Jania, the daughter of Uzu, for a wife and brought her unto his city, unto Africa. And it came to pass uh, at that time, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, commanded all his people to make for him a strong palace in Egypt. And he also commanded the sons of Jacob to assist the Egyptians in the building. And the Egyptians made a beautiful and elegant palace for a royal habitation. And he dwelt therein, and he renewed his government, and he reigned securely. Skipping down, and Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, captain of the host to Angeus, the king of Dinhaba, was still daily enticing Angeus to prepare for battle to fight with the sons of Jacob in Egypt. And Angeus was unwilling to do this thing, for his servants had relayed to him all the might of the sons of Jacob, what they had done unto them in their battle with the children of Esau. And Zepho was in those days daily enticing Angeus to fight with the sons of Jacob in those days. Do you, do you see this dude? He's thirsty to, to, to destroy us, man. He's thirsty to destroy the children of Israel. And after some time, Angeus hearkened to the words of Zepho and consented to him to fight with the sons of Jacob in, in Egypt. And Angeus got all his people in order, a people numerous as the sand which is upon the seashore. And he formed his resolution, uh, resolution to go to Egypt to battle. And amongst the servants of Angeus was a youth 15 years old, Balaam, the son of Beor, and his name and the youth was very wise and understood the art of witchcraft. Or do you mean voodoo? Hmm. Hmm. And when Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, saw that Angeus uh, despaired, despair, despaired, I don't know, of going forth to battle with the Egyptians, Zepho fled from Angeus from Africa, and he went and came unto Chittim. And all the people of Chittim received him with great honor, and they hired him to fight their battles all the days. And Zepho became exceedingly rich in those days. And the troops of the kings of the king of Africa still spread themselves in those days. And the children of Chittim assembled and went to Mount uh, Kuptizia on the account of the troops of Angeas, king of Africa, who were advancing upon them. And it was one day that Zepho lost a young heifer, and he went to seek it, and he heard it lowing round about the mountain. And Zepho went, and he saw, and behold, there was a large cave at the bottom of the mountain, and there was a great stone there at the entrance of the cave, and Zepho split the stone, and he came into the cave, and he looked, and behold, a large animal was devouring the ox. From the middle upward it resembled a man, from the middle downward it resembled an animal. And Zepho rose up against the animal and slew it with his swords." And the inhabitants of Chittim heard this thing, and they rejoiced great, uh, exceedingly. And they said, What shall we do unto this man who has slain this animal that devoured our cattle? And they assembled. I listen, I know I just read over the fact that there was a half man, half beast eating a cow. But, you know, <laughs> that's not the point of this video. Uh, and they all assembled to consecrate one day in the year to him. And they called the name thereof Zepho after his name. And they brought unto him drink offerings year after year on that day. And they brought unto him gifts. So as you can see, Zepho, he ruled over the children of Chittim. Right? Skipping down uh, to verse, uh, let me see, 23. At the revolution of the year, the troops of Africa continued coming to the land of Chittim to plunder as usual. And Zepho, son of Eliphaz, heard their report, and he gave orders concerning them, and he fought with them. And they fled before him, and he delivered the land of Chittim for them. The children of Chittim saw the valor of Zepho, and the children of Chittim resolved that they made Zepho a king over them. And he became king over them, and whilst he reigned, they went to subdue the children of Tubal and all the surrounding islands. So now the children of Chittim start to take over their other brethren. 
and their king, Zepho, went at their head and made war with Tubal and the islands and subdued them. And when they returned from the battle, they renewed his government for him. And they built for him a very large palace for his royal habitation, seat and seat. And they made him a large throne for him. And Zepho reigned over the whole land of Chittim and over the land of Atalia. 50 years. The land of Italia. Now we're going to skip down all the way actually to Jasher chapter 90. And at the time, and at, uh, excuse me, at that time in the 50th year after the children of Israel had passed over Jordan, after the children of Israel had rested from their war with the Canaanites, at that time great and severe battles arose between Edom and the children of Kittim. And see, you know, I guess, A, hey, I guess things weren't weren't sweet anymore, right? At first, Zepho, he gave them everything. He gave them civilization. He he colonized them. Him and, and Jesus, they colonized the Kittim. But it seems like the Kittim have now turned around and are now colonizing the Edomites. And at that, excuse me, at that time, great and severe battles arose between Edom and the children of Kittim, and the children of Kittim fought against Edom, and and Abanius, king of Chittim, went forth in that year, that is in the thirtieth, thirty-first year of his reign, and with a great force with him and the mighty men of the children of Chittim, and he went to Seir to fight against the children of Esau, and Hadad, the king of Edom, heard his report, and he went to meet him with a heavy people and strong force, and engaged in battle with him in the field of Edom. And the hand of Chittim prevailed over the children of Esau. The children of Chittim slew the children of Esau, two and twenty thousand men. And all the children of Esau fled from before them. And the children of Chittim pursued them, and they reached Hadad, king of Edom, who was running before them, and they caught him alive and brought him to Ibanius, king of Chittim. And Ibanius ordered him to be slain. And Hadad, king of Edom, died in the forty-eighth year of his reign. And the children of Chittim continued their pursuit of Edom, and they smote them with a great slaughter. And Edom became subject to the children of Chittim. And the children of Chittim ruled over Edom, and Edom became under the hand of the children of Chittim and became one kingdom from that day. And from that time, they could no more lift up their heads, and their kingdom became one with the children of Chittim. And Ibanius placed officers in Edom, and all the children of Edom became subject and tributaries to Albanius, and tributary to Albanius, and Albanius turned back to his own land, Chittim. And when he returned, he renewed his government and built for himself a spacious and fortified palace for a royal residence, and reigned securely over the children of Chittim and over Edom. And in those days, after the children of Israel had driven away all the Canaanites and Amorites, Joshua was old and advanced in years. So while the children of Edom got conquered, the children of Israel are conquering. Now, you guys remember that movie Us? Remember that scene where it's, it's showing you the differences? Like uh, on one side, she's having fun at the amusement park. The other, she's underground, right? Now we can see the parallels and now we can see the hatred the jealousy, the envy, right? And what did they do? They came and switched places with us. See, Edom is actually the Africans, right? Not all the Africans, you know what I mean. That's their land, right? And Edom, mixed, with, mixed in with the Chittim, have come over here and started acting like this is their land. It's funny how that works out, right? That's the movie Us, <laughs> in a nutshell. Let me see. Because there was a part that was very, very important. Dang, where is it, man? Let 
Oh my gosh, I can't find it. Okay, here it is. Uh, verse 28. And it came to pass in those days that Ibanius, king of, of Chittim, died in the 38th year of his reign. That is the seventh year of his reign over Edom. And they buried him in his place, in his place, which he had built for himself. And Latinius reigned in his stead 50 years. And during his reign, he brought forth an army and he went forth against the inhabitants of Britannia and Kernania, the children of Elisha, son of Javan. And he prevailed over them and made them tributary. And he heard that Edom had revolted under the hand of Chittim and Latinius went to them and smote them and subdued them and placed them under the hand of the children of Chittim. And Edom became one kingdom with the children of Chittim all the days. Who did it? Latinius. Or not Latinus. Excuse me. I said it wrong. Latinus. I'm tripping. <laughs> And for many years, there was no king in Edom and their government was with the children of Kittim and their king. Why am I reading all this, bro? Well, let's figure out who Latinus was. Latinus was both was a figure in both Greek and Roman mythology. He was often associated with the heroes of the Trojan War, namely Odysseus and Aeneas. I don't know. Although his appearance in the something is irreconcilable, I don't know, with uh, his appearance in Greek mythology. The two pictures are not so different. I don't care about his pictures. Let's go to this. And Hesoid's uh, Theogony Lat La uh, Latinus, Latinus was the son of Odysseus and uh, Suri, Circe, I don't know, bro. I don't know how to say these, these names. Who ruled over uh, Tai Sinoi. Presumably the Etruscans. So, this Latinus dude, he ruled over the Etruscans. Now, do we, do we possibly know who the Etruscans actually are. Are the Etruscans actually Edomites who got conquered by the children of Chittim and that formed the Roman Empire? And when you look into the, uh, the Etruscans, listen, a lot, a, a lot about them has to do with uh, being from the Americas, believe it or not. Believe it or not. For example, they called themselves, let me see if I have it. They called themselves uh, Racena, and that means the people. Now, I've already gone over what that means. Everyone who comes from the, the, the line of Shem, they usually call themselves the people in some sort of way. Or at least the people who uh, come from the Holy Lands of the Americas. So that's interesting. And this is a book that, uh, you know, people can, can buy if they want to. Carthage, because this is what I actually think um, that that was talking about when um, Edom was in, I mean, Zepho was in Africa and he and he was uh, doing his dealings with that king. I don't know if Zepho is uh, this person I'm about to mention or it was that other dude. I'm not really sure. This uh, Hannibal Barca of Carthage. That could that could be Zepho. It really could be. In year 247, the year Hannibal Barca was born, the Carthage Empire was about 500 years old, known as one of the greatest stra uh, strateg strategists in military history. The battles of Hannibal would strike a turning point in the history of the continent that would be called Africa. Carthage had been settled by Phoenicians as a city-state in North Africa. Hold on. Hold on. Are all the Phoenicians, are they all one thing? No. And when you see Phoenician, how do you know which one is which? It's hard to really say, man. <laughs> you don't really know, right? Oh, man. And listen, guys, I have a book that 
pretty much exposes who some other Phoenicians are. I'm not going to say all because there's no such thing as all, but who some other Phoenicians, where do they come from? Carthage has been has been settled by Phoenicians as a city state in North Africa near the current Tunis. In his 1961 work, French historian Gabriel uh, Adusio comments that he considered Hannibal to be neither a Phoenician or Carthaginian, nor a Punic, but a North African. The majority of the Punic populace seems to have had African, indeed Negroid, ancestry, whether des described as Carthaginians, Phoenicians, or Punics of North Africa, according to Odysseo's research, they are certainly a mix of Aboriginal North Africans that included the native Berbers, Moors, and other groups. The Phoenicians were a Semitic language people. English writers and speakers can thank the Phoenicians for the current English uh, phonic system. The English alphabets were borrowed from the Phoenician script. Their cultural influence was wide through the Mediterranean Sea nations. They were known as skilled sea merchant traders. They ruled in pre-Roman and prehistoric Iberia, currently Spain and Portugal nations on the Iberian Peninsula, until losing against Rome in the Third Punic War. The city Carthage was destroyed by the Romans. There is no picture of Hannibal in existence today. The coin above is frequently presented by commentators as a presentation of Hannibal and his legacy of tamed elephants. While the writer is not able to find an academic source for this coin to confirm its date, which is more than 2,000 years ago, and we don't know, but the existence of such coinage during some point during our common age is no surprise in light of Hannibal's historic legacy. And we can see this coin. That looks like a Negro. 110%. That's, that's a, that's a so-called black person, whether they're African or American or wherever they're from. And they're supposed to be Hannibal. <laughs> supposed to be, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I have no idea. But that's all I wanted to share for this video. Maybe you guys can now look into Carthage and look into the Etruscans. And try to see some of the similarities between what I just read you. It literally just said that Lat, uh, Lat, the Latinus, he conquered. He was known for conquering the Etruscans, right? He ruled over them. He ruled over the Etruscans. He conquered and ruled over them. And what did Latinus do in the book of Jasher? He conquered the Edomites and ruled over them. And they became one people from that day. The Etruscans originally... They were more biracial looking, right? But many of them were definitely black or Negro looking. Absolutely 110%. And that's interesting. And by the way, in the book of Jasher, uh, Zepho is not necessarily the same as the rest of the Edomites, right? And I'm not talking about their relation. I'm talking about where they are, where their culture is and things of that sort. Zepho was ruling in a different part. The, e the children of Esau, the children of Edom, they were in a different part. Right? So when the scriptures is talking about Esau and things of that sort, when it's talking about Rome, it's only talking about a certain sect of Esau and Rome. Only the children of Zepho were the ones who pretty much uh, started up the Roman Empire and they were under the control, right? The dominion of the Kittim, the seed line of Cain. But the rest of the Edomites, where were they? All those stories that it talks about with uh, Herod and things of that sort, we don't even know uh, if that's all the Edomites, where the Edomites are, if there's Edomites anywhere else. It only talks about one sect of, of so-called Jews or the Southern Kingdom it only talks about that little piece of it. Where's the rest? <laughs> Where's the rest? Not all Esau is wicked. That's not necessarily true. But a certain sect of them are. In the same way how a certain sect of Jacob are wicked. But most of the most of the hatred or most of the contention that we're feeling are about certain groups of people. They're not who we really think they are. Again, the, the Romans, right? They're, they're a mixture of the Chittim 
and the sons of Esau. So Esau is in the mix. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that the Etruscans, the real early ones, look like straight up Africans. And I'm not talking about melanade. No, they look like Africans. They look like Nubians. I have not been able to prove that the Etruscans are Nubians. But it seems like they were Phoenicians. But anyway, that's all I have for you guys in this one. Um, I'll come at you with another one later on. May peace be with you.